that lifeline learning, I mean, it's thrown around all the time, but, you know, frankly, I do it for pure selfish reasons. I mean, you know, from a neurocognitive perspective, I want to be as bright and keep my brain as healthy as I can, right? And we know that that's do novel things, learn new things. I mean, and why not learn things that, you know, you're passionate about and can actually make a difference. That natural curiosity, you gotta, you have to have in that post-professional area. Tim, welcome to the show. I'm super excited to uh, talk to you. I'm over here in North Carolina. Tim's in um, Colorado. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tim is somebody that I've had an opportunity to get to know a long time now ago. <laughs> it feels like um, it shouldn't be that long ago now. But, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to have him on the show today and really get to talk, you know, about some things I think that are really important, especially with regards to manual therapy and education and sort of what manual therapy education looks across the educational lifespan. And I can't imagine anybody being able to really have this conversation better than, you know, Tim, because he really has been on all sides of the uh, education adventure, um, being both consumer and as well as a deliverer of education in various um, pathways and journeys in people's lives. And so, Tim, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today, Derek. And yes, we go back, I guess, a long ways now, which is kind of kind of wild for sure. So yeah, I still remember that it was 2008 when Evidence in Motion was, uh, you know, kind of getting off the ground and you trusted a few of us lowly schleps to <laughs> be a part of a part of the organization in regards to a uh, um, fellowship training and such. And I'll always, uh, you know, value that time uh, very well. Well, I think that since we are talking about education, I mean, I look at, I like you have been super fortunate that I was put into positions to teach way before I thought I was capable of doing it by people that I were very well respected, you know, Phil Greenman, uh, John Bradillon, you know, John Minnell. Uh, uh, it was, you know, I'm around these people and I'm way too young. And, uh, you know, I guess they call it imposter syndrome now. But, you know, you're, you're just saying, wow. Having said that, you know, that's really what our role has always been, I think, is to, to empower, you know, those around us to just do better and to be better than we are in terms of both the practice of what we do, but also, you know, you know, teaching others going forward. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought all that up. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've always respected about your position is that you've always maintained, you know, sort of the, the foot in the door of clinical um, relevance as well too. Um, and, I, and so I think that that's always meaningful. You know, I think we all start in some way or form with educating PTs, you know, in that clinical setting. Uh, I remember when I first got my first student, I think I was only out six months of PT school. So talk about imposter syndrome. I was teaching a student as a CI um, from somebody who, you know, was only going to graduate six months before me. And somebody asked me how that went. I was like, well, <laughs> I don't think I could really teach them much, but I could kind of help guide them a little bit. Um, but I felt like there's always been that imposter uh, syndrome, um, even for, for, for everyone, I think is kind of refreshing to hear. Indeed. Um, so the, I have a, uh, you know, the, the topic of our conversation today is, you know, and it's about, physical therapy, and probably more importantly, I think, especially for our listeners here, orthopedic manual physical therapy um, future in education and how it starts with the education setting and environments. And I think we wanted to talk about it from the um, professional side of education. So entry-level education going through post-professional education. And I might even add a little bit in there, this wasn't part of our initial discussion, but post post-professional <laughs> educational journey, because uh, I think a lot of us are now starting to face uh, that part of our career paths. And so uh, I guess before we even get into that, um, let let our listeners know how you really kind of became interested in 
manual therapy specifically? I think we all are familiar with the work that you've done and the research that you've contributed to uh, the field, but like, where did it all start? How did you, how did you get interested in this? How'd you get the bug? Well, it's, it's funny because I often joke my manual therapy training. I went to Marquette, uh, graduated in 1983 and I, we had a four hour block on manual therapy. That was the extent. And not only was that the extent of the block, it was on a Friday morning and the Thursday night before my wife and I had gotten engaged, she was in PT school. And of course, uh, we were provided with way too many uh, cheap uh, shots. So I just remember that next morning being super hungover. And that was our only manual therapy block we got. I mean, I was super excited given my state. And uh, um, so that was really my initial entry into manual therapy, but it was just a sliver. <laughs> How that won you over, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but actually, you know, I was in ROTC, so I went um, I went into the Army right out of PT school and was stationed down in, in San Antonio at Brook Army Medical Center. And I was, you know, life is a lot. You know, people say it's hard work, but it's luck as well. I mean, I could have gotten sent somewhere differently, but at the time, it was just kind of a bevy of super outstanding physical therapists, um, musculoskeletal imaging, you know, uh, but manual therapy as well. There's a couple, Steve Stratton was one and that just was, you know, going to Michigan State osteopathic program at the time, you know, they're continuing education program and just saying, hey, this is where you need to be at, you know, this is where you got to go, et cetera. But I, I was just immersed in this musculoskeletal world and you just were expected, you know, to, to know this material and to be good with your hands. And um, so I think I was lucky in that regard, but, you know, my first exposures uh were you know teaching you know just extremity manipulation and spinal manipulation people with acute pain uh syndromes coming in and and then very quickly i think it was a year or two in i went to michigan state for a five-day uh, principles of manual medicine course and that was a game changer because it really first it was a small group of primarily DOs, couple MDs, and a handful of physical therapists. But the, again, the faculty was, you know, I mean, it was Phil Greenman, John Minnell, John Bordillon, you know, uh, I think Carl Steele, uh, who was a PT, but then went on to become a DO. And, you know, it was like a student faculty ratio about one to six, you know, uh, or six to one. And, and it was, uh, just an immersion. And I realized how little I knew, but how, how powerful it was and that these folks two had, which been orthopedic surgeons and had given up essentially surgery because they just believed in manual medicine, non-operative care, you know, back in the, you know, this is now the mid eighties. So it was very powerful, both from the technical aspect, but also from the professionalization of, of what manual medicine really was. So that, that really launched my, uh, career. And, you know, when I ended up going back for my master's, I guess it was in 88 to 90, I went to Michigan State in the osteopathic school. Um, they had a biomechanics department, which was somewhat traditional biomechanics and the fact that we're doing a lot of tissue mechanics and stress strain curves and the like. But Phil Greenman, Dr. Greenman was a member of that faculty. And I knew if I went there, I could take more of these courses while I was there. And I uh, just kept pestering him until he said, well, Tim, why don't you just come to clinic with me a couple of days a week? I'm like, yeah. And so that was like, you know, the beginning of the quote, classic kind of mentorship of, you know, one-on-one -on -one in the clinic, you know, uh, you know, 12, 16 hours a week, just watching a truly master clinician. Um, and that's when you realize manual medicine is described there and manual uh, therapy or manual physical therapy, as we now know it, it's holistic. And it, it, you know, technically, yeah, he, he was a skilled manipulator, but it was all the other stuff, his, his patient uh, interaction that we now call therapeutic alliance was off the charts, 
you just wanted this guy to be your doc. I mean, it was just connectivity with people and could be very firm on, you know, Hey, you got to do your homework. Um, but came from a place that, you know, you, you just trusted. And so, yeah, you look back and th those elements just, you know, launched my passion and career and which goes to say how important it is. I think that early career therapists, you know, even if it's, you know, it's harder yards and, you know, not getting paid as much, it does shift your entire trajectory. If you can have those first couple of years around people that actually are doing it the right way and are, and are really patient focused and understand, um, despite the system that's really broken, that we can still make a difference. And then that, and that will truly launch your trajectory, I believe. You know, it's interesting that um, one of the things I picked up on when you said there, and I've heard this from a lot of people who have gone on to be successful in their careers is they, they pester, they, they beg, um, they yearn for the mentorship, you know, they, they take charge in their own education. Um, you know, and I've had a lot of conversations around that with, um, DBT students, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that conversation later about some of the you know, generational changes and differences and things like that. But I still think that there's value in, you know, um, taking charge of that. And everybody that I've met that's done something very well is they're basically like, just they, they don't stop knocking on the door. And eventually somebody is going to open that door and say, okay, fine, I'll let you in. But if, if you look across the board, that seems to be one of those character traits of a, you know, somebody that has gone on to become a great clinician. Um, and then, you know, have some level of impact, wherever that impact might be defined as. So um, nice and refreshing to hear you say that. And, and it just occurred to me as we're talking that part of, I think, that trait is you are um, vulnerable. You're going to get told no. You're going to be putting yourself out there. And I think there's an openness in that. I think maybe it displays a bit of openness in how you then view um, science, how you view learning, how you view, you view growth. And so maybe part of that is just a trait that you kind of need, that needs to be there in order to grow, I think, you know? Yeah, it's one of the things that I actually tell um, even our students and when they're when they're learning things, either if it's either an entry level PT student or if I'm teaching fellows or whatever it might be, I always say, here's two things you got to do. You have to give feedback and then you have to crave feedback, even if it's feedback that you don't necessarily want to receive, but you have to beg for that <laughs> level of feedback because ultimately that's going to help you um, grow as well too. So, you know, I think that that's um, a big part of um, that educational adventure. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know your career track and your trajectory um, a fair amount you know, and so coming out of the, the military, you know, obviously you, you were a consumer of education, you were taught, and then at some point, you know, and, you, and you're always a learner, um, so I'm not going to say that you're not still learning, but at some level you then um, changed, and I know that you went into sort of almost a post-professional focus of education, and then kind of shifted into some entry level back again, but uh, talk to us a little bit about you know, what I guess was the next catalyst, if I'm going to think about phases in um, educational journey, where you started to say, hey, you know what, we need we need to do something bigger, maybe we need to educate um, at a larger scale or a larger shift or something like that. And that was probably the early 2000s. I'm sure that that happened. But talk to us a little bit about what kind of went into your your mindset around all of that. Um Well, I mean, there's a, a few things there wrapped in there. I think it his, I think as it relates to AOMPT, I think there is a story there that we'll get to that because I really think my passion for manual therapy, I mean, I, I, my PhD was not that. I learned a lot about a little, which PhDs are. You know, you learn a method, you learn a lot, and it was really in bone stress injuries and things that were away from manual therapy. And this is in the 90s. So I come out in 97, the ACPAR guidelines are saying, you know, PTs, don't do anything uh, for back pain, except, you know, this manipulation thing seems to have a little bit of 
benefit. And our own professional association didn't jump on that and say, well, hell yeah, that's what we do. So um, we kind of fought those guidelines as well as everybody else that didn't like what the answer was. And um, so I came out during that time a little like, whoa, I'm, I'm a manual therapist, even though I've kind of done this PhD and I was back into entry level teaching. And I felt strongly that, you know, these skills are basic skill sets of entry level professionals that you need to know how to manipulate the spine. You need to know how to uh, manipulate the extremities. And that's just a basic skill set to manage one of the prime largest conditions we see is that of spinal disorders. So that to me was obvious as I entered, you know, I was now at Army Baylor and so I was teaching there. But I also became a member of the academy. And at that time, I just assumed, you know, we were pushing, you know, manipulation and entry level practice, you know, that that was just a basic skill set. And it, it was, I wasn't um, met with quite the the excitement that across the academy. And again, I don't, it was well intended, but a lot of folks felt that this was a, you know, a higher level post-professional skill. And clearly you get better and better post-professionally, but there are a skill set that are really, all of us need to have an entry level. And we now do that, but that wasn't the, at the time, uh, the prevailing wisdom and why I was passionate about it was because the need was there. And I look back to my education where my mentors, osteopathic physicians, one in particular, Phil Greenman, caught hell for teaching PT spinal manipulation because they felt that a lot of the osteopaths felt that, no, that's within their realm, you know, and that shouldn't be done. And he was like, well, hey, Who's going to be doing it? Because he's, he was seeing way back in the 80s that physician graduates of DO schools were migrating into traditional residencies and really becoming more traditional uh, silo based specializations and losing their manual medicine skills. And it was very intentional that says, if we don't continue to teach these skills, they will be lost and we will not have this skill set in in U.S. healthcare. And so that's why I, you know, in the back was very passionate about having that uh, uh, be a skill set of PTs and entry level. But to your question now, then, you know, scaling up post-professionally, you know, I was just fortunate, you know, again, you know, somebody picks up the phone and wants to be part of your uh, wants you them on your committee. And the person on the other end of the line was a guy named John Childs. And, um, you know, he wanted to do this RCT. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'd be happy to be on your committee and whatnot. And he describes it as being a very nervous call to someone, you know, like this expert, you know, and I was looking like, oh, this young, he, eager person wants to r collaborate. That's awesome, you know. And uh, so, but from that, you know, we did research together and clearly evidence in motion begins to formulate. I was already doing some CD production back in the day, you know, doing little yeah. digital Mavica Sony 15 second video clips and smashing them on a CD. I don't know if they have those little discs. They're called CDs. They right. have those things anymore. But yeah, so that was, so we were, my Lisa wife wasn't and I, VHS. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Indeed. So, but yeah, so that, that quickly we realized the demand for, you know, continuing med medical education was con continuing to be there, but ultimately the data also was showing that wasn't changing behaviors, right? You just didn't change behaviors with just one-off CEs. You needed more ongoing connectivity with people. And that really, from that stemmed, you know, really residency and fellowship training and certifications and post-professional training that was more skin in the game, if you will, it was longer so that you kind of had to commit a bit to, to doing that. And I look back in my career and I, oh, even though I wasn't in the formalized system, I was going through a series of courses that would be certificate like, but the people around you were equally hungry and you'd go to class all day learning these techniques and then you'd eat and then you'd grab a table and then you spend the next three hours practicing, you know, with uh, three or four of you, like making sure you really had it, 
you know, before the next day. And that passion, you know, I think really makes the expert, you know, where you got it, you got to get reps, you know, I mean, you know, you do it one or two times. It's now I'm learning to play golf. And, you know, man, I can tell you that the amount of reps to just get minimally competent is a ton. I mean, that's just to get minimally competent. And I think it's like any motor skill, you know, you got to, you got to be passionate about it. You got to do the, got to do the reps. And so that really led to more of the, a certification residency fellowship kind of training that we got involved with. Um, you know, it's, uh, so that's a little sidebar because you mentioned your PhD and, um, so for our listeners out there, I actually uncovered unearthed some of your original PhD work because I personally had a bone stress injury and I was like, that can't be that Tim Flynn on those studies. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it ultimately was. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that you had that sort of background that it obviously now I know how it um, really just morphed really quickly back to manual therapy, but there was a, a brief flirtation apparently with bone stress injuries. <laughs> and I, I'm still quite interested in them. And had I gone a different route, I probably would have continued on, but I was, you know, in the era of PhD where you have to do something novel. And, um, and so I was trying to figure out if this vibrational characteristics of tibias were, would be related prognostically to, to, uh, bone stress injuries, which were very common in the military, the tibia. So, and, you know, we I got the instrument to be reliable. And, and then we, once I got back into the army, we did some studies at army Baylor and it just, it didn't, um, pan out that, I mean, there's so many factors involved that, um, but I was always big and still am that bone quality is a very different measure than bone density. Density is a, you know, a contributor to quality, but that is just one marker, you know, of, of, of health and of quality. Yeah. And so, yeah, still, still interesting. I read stuff here and there on it. No, it's, it was just funny to see, um, out there, um, bone stress injury might have been a little bit easier to handle than something ubiquitous like low back pain. <laughs> um, a little bit easier to diagnose um, yeah. and have an actual real pathoanatomical medical um, explanation really in some regards. But uh, so you chose something a little bit more difficult and challenging, which is good. We're all happy you did. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think there's been a lot to sort of unpack here already a little bit. I want to take you now to where you are at currently, you know, providing entry level education to manual therapists. And, and as you said, you know, when you went through PT school, and even when I went through PT school, even though it was, you know, some years later, um, it wasn't much different, you know, like we, we didn't learn, we certainly didn't learn manipulation. Uh, we did not learn. And then the manual therapy that we learned was, you know, obviously based on a lot of theoretical models that would just typically confuse the heck out of somebody not smart enough like me to understand those things. And so, um, you know, here we are now in a whole different era and you're in a different era of your educational and, and teaching sort of career with that. Um, you know, what, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you love, I guess, about teaching in entry level? I mean, I, I think that's where you're having a lot of impact. And I think, you know, I, I love the topic of this because I do think that, it's really important for our next generation of manual therapists to gain some sort of footing in entry level education. And we can do that now, whereas we couldn't do it before yet. We still were, were, were successful. You know, what, what, I, I guess, yeah. What's, what, what's your passion and what do you, what do you see as um, sort of the future of education and, and manual therapy and entry level? Well, I mean, I'm extremely passionate about it and it is what I, you know, the, our health system is so bad and it just, it's just crying for people that can think, that can have therapeutic hands and that can, you know, connect with human beings because that's just, to me, part of the skill set allows us to actually move people to, to optimal health. And, but you have to, to me, it's a window in that, to, to that, despite just the basics of treating, say, neuromuscular conditions with, with hands-on care. Um, 
I think the bias is what I like about entry level. You we can, you know, we're all biased, but we can at least not bias them according to even, I mean, yeah, within the century, people, you know, are, are saying, you know, the dangers of manual therapy and programs not teaching it because it's dangerous, you know, and I'm like, you know, it's just a wild thing that when you look back the history, we were doing manipulation at the beginning of, you know, in the 1920s at the beginning of our profession, you know, I mean, that was the basics of uh, our profession was hands-on manual manipulative type care. So it's weird how, you know, things got distorted, but I really don't want to leave this talk with or discussion without saying that as the academy and the manual therapy group, our role is that of teachers. And I'm so excited. There's so many fellows that are on faculty throughout the country. And you look and talk to programs and everybody, you know, says, you know, they're excited about their your orthopedic or musculoskeletal faculty, you know. Well, there's a couple reasons. Almost all of these are still clinicians. They're actually still te seeing patients in some capacity, limited often just due to the other responsibilities, but are clinicians. They have stories about real patients right now, uh, currently. They, the, their passion for what they do exudes through. They're not telling stories of 20 years ago when I saw this patient, you know, and uh, students react to that. And I think that's where I don't, I'm curious, I, the number of fellows that are on faculty, it has to be quite high. Um, and what's even more exciting to me is so many programs now are finally shifting, whether they're residency or uh, blended models that, you know, say, you know, those that should be teaching clinical skills should be clinicians. You know, they should be expert clinicians. You know, I don't want my surgeon taught by someone that doesn't do surgery. I just don't feel that's a good way to do business. You know, um, it shouldn't be, you know, the anatomy professor that's teaching it. You know, it should actually be the surgeon that's teaching how to do surgery, you know? <laughs> and I think it's crazy how distorted our profession got away from the expertise of the clinician really driving uh, the educational system. And so that's kind of what I'm most passionate about. And I think that manual therapy is really leading that charge in that through the fellowship programs and that many of those graduates go on to be either uh, uh, full-time faculty or adjunct faculty leading, you know, uh, various uh, components of the curriculum. Yeah, you know, and it's it's fascinating, like you said, manual therapy has been a part of what we do. And, you know, it's certainly a part of orthopedic management. Um, you know, you're not, you know, by putting your hands on somebody and you establish that relationship as well, and you learn how to communicate and have empathy and all the, the other components that are around it. But it's not even just um, orthopedic care. I've actually talked to a lot of the faculty within our program who, you know, employ manual interventions across other types of settings. And I think, you know, and one of the things that for me, when it was time, when I moved from primarily teaching post-professional education to moving into entry-level education, I think I remember, I can't remember who it was that gave me this advice. They're like, but you got to be careful because you're going to have, you know, neurogeriatric, pediatric interest um, from students in, in these programs. But I have found that, so I teach a an advanced manual therapy class and about 90% of the students um, in our program take that advanced manual therapy class, even if they're going into pediatrics or neuro or some other realm, because I think even they're starting to recognize the importance of hands-on care across all different kinds of specializations and, and areas. You know, I, I'm so hopeful that that, that, is the case. It's not a musculoskeletal skill. Yeah, it we use it a lot in musculoskeletal care, but you know, I love when I see uh the pro predominant neurological diagnosis patient. I mean, again, most of these disor disorders end up affecting the movement system. When the movement system doesn't get to go through its range, it has impairments that need some, some, some hands-on care to get them through and to ease movement, you know, and it, it's, it makes 
it's so much sense. I mean, our pediatric team, you know, Colorado Motion, they very hands-on focused. I mean, they are manual therapy oriented. They don't think in the, anything of it, right? You know, that's, you know, so much have restricted movement systems. If you're not doing some type of manual intervention, you really are not offering them a uh, top of the line skill set, you know, and again, you can move on into Parkinson's, another, you know, example where again, loss of full movements begin to create impairments at the joint soft tissue levels that make it even further difficult to move right you know and and it yeah i just wish we'd get out of our silos i i mean people are and i just hope this new generation just sees it as you know the, this is just it's not a silo you know we treat human bodies and these skill sets cr uh, cross all of our quote unquote you know specialties of care yeah i think that's something that we're kind of seeing there all right, so we're we're moving along in the journey, and you know, talking about the importance of um, uh, manual therapy education in as a you know professional uh, student level. Post professional education um, is something that you know you're still um, involved in. You know, certainly when we think about that. We think about orthopedic residency or residency, I should say, in fellowship training. And you know, what what are your thoughts on on that and how you know how important that is for our profession you know here i'll uh, go up a level here in big picture i think you know post professional training ongoing learning is just it's the nature of being a professional you know so whether or not you go to residency or fellowship uh, hopefully at a minimum, some type of certification pathway where you, you go deeper into an area of practice. I mean, yeah, a superficial knowledge of certain things like, you know, a patient comes in, they have a diagnosis I've never heard of, you know, I, I can, I can look up to get a basic understanding of what this diagnosis is, but, you know, and I don't necessarily go deep down into that you know, specialization, but some specializations that I need that are core to who I am as a professional, I need to, and you pick whatever that is, but I just feel that depth uh, versus breadth coming out of a, of a professional program is necessary because you, you got to go in deep and sometimes, you know, you go down a rabbit hole and it, you find ugh, you're frustrated that you didn't get as much out of it as you wanted, but actually you did because it's the discipline of driving deeper into a, uh, an area of practice that allows you then to come back out and be, frankly, more efficient when you go down others as well. So I'm a big believer in whatever you're your passion and is to go down a pathway. And we, I think programs have gotten better at, um, of, uh, putting into modules ways to do that again, where you could maybe do such a certification, uh, and maybe that can build on into a residency model can build on into a fellowship type model. So I think, you know, uh, various, uh, post-professional training programs, whether they be at the university level or um, private level, are getting better at doing that. And I think as a as consumer or student, you know, can has more opportunities at that graduate, has more opportunities to find those. Um, so that that's my main, I guess, takeaway of that. Yeah, no, and that's, um, you know, so good and so great. I know that, you know, every student is going to be a little bit different. I always talk to them about, you know, you have to self-reflect, but at some level, if you um, find yourself not passionate or interested in, uh, you know, seeking more, then, then it's probably a reflection of other things going on as well, too, that you have to kind of um, think about. But um, there is, you know, I think you even said earlier, sometimes you have to make those those investments are a little bit different in a way that maybe isn't what they're quite ready and comfortable for, but then the payout, um, whether it's financial payout or maybe it's just professional satisfaction, um, certainly comes into to play as you go through those, those paths. I, you know, I don't speak to too many people who have gone through, um, who have gone into the depths, like you've said, um, who have gone deep into the caves of things. 
um, come back out. Maybe they come away with some some new letters, some certifications, some fellowship training, and things like that. They tend to be the ones that um, I find to be the the, the happiest, the healthiest, um, in a sense. Even though it seems like they wouldn't be because of the amount of like effort that it took to get there. And it it relates to. I mean, we won't go deep into you know the the problems of higher education, the costs, et cetera. But we it, it's well known, right? And so part of it is while financially it you know it just doesn't make sense to continue to pour more in and that i clearly see the argument and yet sometimes we don't talk about the fact that if you leave the profession you burn out and you leave due to due to dissatisfaction which is often because you feel like you're not successful with clients you know you just you burn out because you don't get the 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 hit uh that you get when people are successful, right? When you have success around you and your patients and clients are, you know, are, are, have gratitude and short gratitude towards you, you feed off of that. And it, you know, it, it now does not become work. It becomes passion. It becomes truly your professional journey. And I do think that that there's a cost if you don't have that because you probably will leave the profession early you know which is a financial hit whether you have to retrain your skill set uh which you will into something else or you know some other type of thing and so i think that's the, it is that long game where you you know you have to kind of play and there's no right answer for an individual um these big broad statements but i do think it's worth looking at it that way, the people that go in deep, they generally come out passionate, understanding, and have this longer longevity in the profession because they just, they, they results improve. And because of that, you know, feedback from patients improves. So I want to take us on a little bit of a different adventure before we conclude this show, because I think you know, there was an article that just came out um, in JOSPT. It was a really good one. It was advice to the new grad, right? It was, uh, I think, uh, Jeremy Lewis, Chad Cook, and a few others were on that um, paper. Really nice paper. Um, but here's what I want to ask you, because uh, I think a lot of our listeners, especially Academy listeners, potentially, are, you know, a lot of our membership is fellows. Um, a lot of our mentor membership are people who may be thinking about fellows. Of course, not everybody. There's also non-fellow members, but they also have potentially have gone down a lot of depths and and and, and holes in, in their lives as well. So I want to go into the the post post professional educational journeys and get some of your thoughts on that. So what do you, what do you you're the seasoned person, you have had some successes, you do feel like you are effective in a sense, um, but you're, you're no longer in that sort of, you know, game of trying to, um, you know, build sort of this um, repertoire or resume of certain types of things. You know, what, what does that post post professional education look like in your mind, I guess? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I think that's when you enter the phase that you truly are a self-directed learner that you can really continue to grow by um, you seek out new knowledge and you get more efficient at seeking out new knowledge. But I think that person, you know, it, I don't even look at, I don't look at it as an obligation to teach, whether it be um, being a clinical instructor uh, for an entry level, whether it be a mentor for a resident or fellow. Um, I think it's very selfish that you should do it for selfish reasons, because that to me is that, you know, that next phase of by, you know, and you may have been doing it all along, but you're doing it with a really, you know, uh, different intent of, you know, I want that new learner to challenge me on what is my belief structure and what's going on and this back and forth nature, which then you know, keeps me uh, learning, if you will, going on. So, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, just continuing to be engaged with, you know, from a teaching perspective in whatever form, whether it be at the university or in the clinical environment. The second thing I, I, I would say is going in different directions. And that I think is key, you know, like I've, 
I really have broadened. I mean, I've been, I think, holistic and open to a lot of new ideas, you know, as, as we learn more about the neuroscience of pain mechanisms and things in the last two decades and learning that. But then that exposes you to the fact that, oh, my gosh, you know, look at the gut and the gut microbiome and how, wow, how this is affecting, you know, all these systems that I've been, you know, teasing and using my hands with, and I haven't really been addressing that, you know, the same with breath work and breathing. I haven't been as detailed and had a deep understanding of that, how that interplays in what I'm doing with my manual interventions. And so taking those elements that complement my core, you know, uh, clinical acumen and make sh making sure I'm bringing those into my skill set, you know, and again, the same way you got to go deep sometimes to kind of end up only pulling one or two things that, oh yeah, this is my, I always kind of do this now with patients, you know, it's, you know, and I think our role obviously is distiller, right? You know, we start with a wide range of information, which is out there, but how do we make it really actionable to my patients in front of me? So I think that's the next phase of the post, post-professional phase is really taking newer ideas and, and being, integrating those into, into practice. And then challenging, you know, your, the folks you're working with and teaching, you know, what do you think about this? And this is my mindset is that out there, this is why, you know, watch me do this with a patient, you know, is what do you think of that? Is that, you know, good, bad, indifferent, you know, again, asking for feedback um, and hopefully feedback that is not just, you know, as I say, good job, uh, <laughs> something that's actionable and actually uh, critical that allows you to, 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 to improve. No, I'm glad you did that. It was actually, I, I kind of, um, uh, you took the bait because I wanted you to go down that path. I mean, the only reason why I wanted you to go down that path is it's something that I've actually seen, not just from you, but from other, um, you know, folks who I have respected where it's not just rinse and repeat after you've had your post-professional education where you just, okay, um, I've made it to the mountain and now I'm just going to kind of do what I'm going to do. And I think that that becomes sort of frustrating for the post post-professional phase of somebody's career. That's something that I've always seen that I think very healthy people start to look at things very differently. And you can be sort of focused and myopic in some sense and still go into a lot of depths or you can now start to expand your breadth like you have done and um, certainly, you know, look at things a bit differently. But I think that that's part of that excitement for a lot of folks is that now you can go in and see how everything functions and, and integrates a little bit differently there as well. But so I, I wanted you to actually say that because that's something that I've seen you do. I'm like, oh, what is Tim doing now? Like, <laughs> this was not Tim from 2002. This is Tim from 2024. And it's, and it's got a little, it's got some Tim still, but then it's got a lot of other integrative things as a component to what you do. And I think that's, you know, that is that lifeline learning. I mean, it's thrown around all the time, but, you know, frankly, I do it for pure um, selfish reasons. I mean, you know, from a neurocognitive uh, perspective, I want to be, you know, as bright and, and keep my brain as healthy as I can. Right. And we know that that's do novel things, learn new things. I mean, and why not learn things that, you know, you're passionate about and can actually make a difference, you know, and I do a lot of these things just, you know, and chat with people, you know, at the uh, cocktail party or dinner party about, Hey, I, I read about this. This is pretty cool. Or listen to this podcast. What do you think? And, you know, do you, do you integrate this into your life, you know, and how does that play? And I think that's just that natural curiosity. You gotta, you have to have in that post-professional area. And it, I'll say this, it's interesting. When I went to Fort Collins in 2003, um, there's Colorado has some excellent clinicians. Um, I'll say that straight up. Just really, it was a very open state for private practice for, you know, from the 60s and 70s, you know, so it's a very open state in that regard, you know, lots of people, you know, hanging shingles and doing things. And there was a good practice in town 
and that was doing, you know, was really into this certain technique set and that started in the mid nineties. And now it's already, you know, now let's say about 2005, starting to see patients coming from that area and an excellent clinician, but a couple of patients would say, well, yeah, I'd go, I was going in, but he's still doing the same things he was doing back then. And it stuck with me. Um, and it, doing it well, and again, because I don't believe whatever you do, you do it well, you're going to get good results, you know, and I, I do think there's some agnostic nature ex to to the quote, technique, if you will. But um, what it, it stuck in my mind, like, well, I don't want to be that. I don't want to just be doing, you know, the same thing, you know, 10 years from now that I'm doing now, even five years from now, you know, that I need to continue to grow because, man, the explosion of knowledge, if, if I'm doing the same thing, I'm all this stuff I've read about that, you know, that I don't want to be, you know, so I do think there's a lot to be said for that. And we have to challenge our colleagues and friends more, our friend, friendly colleagues say, man, you know, don't, you got it, you got to move on. And I always, I'm, to the point where sometimes I'll, I have a really good lecture and I, I, I won't repeat it because I'm like, oh, if there's one or two people that have heard it, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> you know, I want to bore them. Right. You know, and it, there's, I think there's a fine dance because like knowledge, you, you have to get some reps at stuff and to, to embody it both as the giver, but also as a receiver, you know, but you just don't want, I just don't want to be stale. <laughs> 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 hey, don't have those same stories all the time coming across. Uh, I don't think you're gonna be stale. Well, Tim, I know that we're getting close to the the end of this uh, uh, the, the time that we had here, and I, I just want to um, you know thank you very much for spending you know time with us today to um, have this conversation. I know that we can probably have a lot of other conversations about a lot of other things um, that I wanted to today, uh, but my hope is is that at least folks can kind of see you know, the importance of, you know, not just manual therapy education, but just education in general and how that, um, you know, enhances what we can, what we can do. And, and I appreciate um, your, your spending time with us today. Well, I've, I, it's been a pleasure as always, Derek, it's, it's fun to have these conversations and I do hope um, the listeners out there, uh, you know, will have these conversations amongst themselves and please reach out to me if you uh, want to chat because this, this areas I'm passionate about. Awesome. We will do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim.